It's hard to imagine that Manson once had aspirations as a singer-songwriter in Hollywood. Same? That's relative. I tried to stop Nixon, and I stopped him dead in his tracks. Do the best thing I know how. Nothing. I'm an old man. All I want to do is retire. Get on the desert and be left alone. I don't want to rob nobody. Tell me in a sentence who you are. Breaking news, Charles Manson, the infamous cult leader who led a string of murders in the 1960s, is dead. He leaves behind a legacy of depraved murder. If you're going to do something, leave something witchy. Just like I would tell you, if you're going to do something, do it well and leave something witchy. Leave a sign to let the world know that you were there. Tears in my eyes, incredible pain in my heart, indestructible memory. All in review. It don't take me to tell you that you're about ten pounds overweight. Just thanks. Things may get improbable. I will forget indelible memory. The drug burn theory. Police originally suspected drugs from the very beginning of their investigation, but the drug burn theory originated from various different sources, some of which still circulate today and suggest that Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski, among some, if not all, of their guests in the house were heavily into drugs, the occult, wild sex orgies, and satanic parties especially when it comes to victim Wojtek Frykowski, who had reportedly been preparing to become the exclusive LA area distributor of a new amphetamine called MDA, with the financial backing of his wealthy girlfriend, Abigail Folger. It is important to note that MDA was found in the systems of both Abigail and Wojtek at the time of their autopsies. According to various reports, on Tuesday, August 5th, 1969, just four days before the murders, 22 people joined Folger and Frakowski for some sort of satanic gathering where it was said a man was seized, stripped, and tied nude to a post. Folger and Frakowski explained that he was being punished for a $2,000 dope burn, allegedly giving poor quality drugs to Jay Sebring, who was another victim. The man was whipped and humiliated throughout an orgy of sex and drugs. Allegations to this effect were first aired by actor Dennis Hopper in an interview with an underground LA newspaper who stated they had fallen into sadism and masochism and bestiality and they recorded it all on videotape too. The LA police told me this. I know that three days before they were killed, 25 people were invited to that house to a mass whipping of a dealer from Sunset Strip who'd given them bad dope. Years later, Manson family member and convicted murderer Bobby Busolet told author Truman Coyote, they burned people on dope deals, Sharon Tate in that gang. They picked up kids on the strip and took them home and whipped them, made movies of it. Asked the cops, they found the movies, not that they'd tell you the truth. Although initially denied by the police, it was later confirmed that remnants of the night's satanic orgy, black hoods, leather aprons, occult items, drug paraphernalia, and sadomasochistic devices were in fact found in the loft above Sharon Tate's living room at 150 Cielo Drive. 
There remains many stories or rumors which detail events which are quite shocking and out of character for a group of Hollywood elites. The Helter Skelter Theory The Helter Skelter Race War Theory is recognized today as the establishment's most likely motive of the Tate and LaBianca murders of 1969, or more commonly referenced simply as the Manson murders. The theory, and keep in mind, that's all it is, is the brainchild of L.A. County Assistant District Attorney Vincent Bugliosi and supported the entire trial and conviction of Charles Manson and several members of what Vincent also called the family. There also remains loads of testimony from various family members that confirmed Manson talked about Helter Skelter constantly. Charles Tex Watson, the man who physically committed nearly all of the murders, allegedly told Manson when they returned from their bloody crimes, Boy, it sure was Helter Skelter. In his book, Helter Skelter, The True Story of the Manson Murders, one of the best true crime books in history, Bugliosi believed that Helter Skelter represented a coming race war where African Americans would rise up and go to war with white America. Vincent would successfully convince not only the jurors in the trial, but the entire nation that the coming of Helter Skelter, which Charles Manson believed, was being revealed to him by the Beatles in their white album song titled Helter Skelter, which has lyrics that directed messages to Charlie to prepare for its coming. According to Vincent, Manson believed that the Beatles were communicating to him through the music and were warning him of the coming Helter Skelter, said in lyrics to be coming down fast and to look out for Helter Skelter. Supporting some of this, Manson himself, while on trial, stated, Is it a conspiracy that the music is telling the youth to rise up against the establishment because the establishment is rapidly destroying things? Is that a conspiracy? The music speaks to you every day, but you are too deaf, dumb, and blind to even listen to the music. It is not my conspiracy. It's not my music. I hear what it relates. It says rise. It says kill. Why blame it on me? I didn't write the music. According to Vincent, Manson would, like a religious prophet, speak to his followers that Helter Skelter was coming and that Manson and his followers, with forewarning, should hide in a cave somewhere in Death Valley, while the entire white civilization was slaughtered, and that once the African Americans took over the world, they would need help running it, because although they would have what it takes to defeat the white man, they would not have the ability to rule, and that this is exactly where Charles and his group of followers would come in. They would all rise from the underground and show the black man or blacky how whitey could do it. Yes, it's very, very racist. Helter Skelter was in fact used heavily by the Manson family, and there was certainly substance to this theory, along with lots of evidence to suggest it. Vincent had to put it all together and present it to the jury, which he did successfully. Susan Atkins, another major participant in the crimes, remembered Charlie obtained the Beatles' so-called White Album in late 1968. It had a tremendous impact on our lives, especially Charlie's. One night when many of us were playing records and listening to the album, Charlie said, they're speaking to me. Charlie was preaching constantly about the end of the world and the need to flee into the country, specifically the desert. The helter-skelter race war theory today remains the most commonly believed version of why the Manson murders of 1969 took place. The Melcher Theory Terry Melcher, the son of Doris Day and his girlfriend, Canvas Virgin, lived at 150 Cielo Drive before Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski. Terry had met Manson at a party at Beach Boy Dennis Wilson's house in Pacific Palisades. With time, Melcher's associate, Greg Jacobson, became fascinated with Charlie's philosophy and lifestyle and began urging Terry to record him. Jacobson talked Melcher into coming down to Spawn's movie ranch to hear Manson and the girls play. After hearing them play, Terry returned to the ranch with a friend he thought might be interested in recording Manson and company. Jacobson recalled, I think Terry showed some interest in the music, but there was nothing positive. There was never any, yes, I will record you talk going on. It was like that was the preliminaries and nothing ever came of it. Manson felt otherwise. Tex Watson recalled, 
Terry, Charlie told us, had made him some big promises and then never come through. Terry, Charlie said, didn't care about anything but money. Gradually, it seemed clearer and clearer, at least to us, that Terry Melcher was the one who had failed Charlie, who had led him along and then betrayed him, who had kept his music from the world. After dinner on August 8th of 1969, Charlie took Tex aside. According to Tex, Manson told him, What I want? I want you to go to that house where Melcher used to live. I want you to take a couple of the girls I'll send with you and go down there and totally destroy everyone in that house, as gruesome as you can. In Susan Atkins' December 1969 published confession, she said, the reason Charlie picked the house was to instill fear into Terry Melcher because Terry had given his word on a few things and never came through with them. A similar theory has been applied to the LaBianca murder. Phil Kaufman, who Charlie befriended in Terminal Island Prison before being released in 1967, had connections to the music industry and was trying to help Manson get a break. Kaufman also used to hang out at the home of Harold True, who until September of 1968 lived on Waverly Drive next to the LaBianca house. None of the Kaufman's music industry connections panned out for Charlie, and Phil suggested that one possible reason why Manson picked the Law Bianca house was to send him a message. Afraid since it began, Hollywood knows Hollywood. Anybody that knows the garbage cans in the alley understands Hollywood. Look out, hell, this can't be. I like these two progressions for some reason. And it makes me think of times at the ranch when we used to play and go up on the Indian Mesa. The Indian Mesa was a Macy mighty man, raised up his little hand to die. In the 1980s, Manson gave four interviews to the mainstream media. The first was recorded at California Medical Facility and aired on June 13th of 1981. It was by Tom Snyder for NBC's The Tomorrow Show. The second was recorded at San Quentin State Prison and aired on March 7th of 1986. It was by Charlie Rose for CBS News Night Watch, and it won the National News Emmy Award for Best Interview in 1987. The third, with Geraldo Rivera in 1988, was part of the journalist's primetime special on Satanism. At least as early as the Snyder interview, Manson's forehead bore a swastika in the spot where the X carved during his trial had been. Nicholas Schreck conducted an interview with Manson for his documentary, Charles Manson Superstar, which was released in 1989. Shrek concluded that Manson was not insane, but merely acting that way out of frustration. On September 25th of 1984, Manson was imprisoned in the California Medical Facility at Vacaville, where inmate Juan Holmstrom poured paint thinner on him and set him on fire, which caused second and third degree burns on over 20% of Manson's body. Holmstrom explained that Manson had objected to his Hare Krishna chants and verbally threatened him. After 1989, Manson was housed in the Protective Housing Unit at California State Prison in Corcoran in Kings County. The unit housed inmates whose safety would be endangered by general population housing. 
He had also been housed at San Quentin State Prison, California Medical Facility, in Vacaville, Folsom State Prison, and Pelican Bay State Prison. In June of 1997, a prison disciplinary committee found that Manson had been trafficking drugs. He was moved from Cochrane State Prison to Pelican Bay State Prison a month later. In March of 2009, a photograph of Manson showing a receding hairline, grizzled gray beard and hair, and the swastika tattoo still prominent on his forehead was released to the public by the California corrections officials. In 2010, the Los Angeles Times reported that Manson was caught with a cell phone in 2009 and had contacted people in California, New Jersey, Florida, and British Columbia in Canada. A spokesperson for the California Department of Corrections stated that it was not known if Manson had used the phone for criminal purposes. Manson also recorded an album of acoustic pop songs with additional production by Henry Rollins titled Completion. Only five copies were pressed, two belonged to Rollins, while the other three are presumed to have been with Manson. The album remains unreleased, but you can find the songs released on YouTube. On April 11th of 2012, Manson was denied release at his 12th parole hearing, which he did not even attend. After his March 27th, 1997 parole hearing, Manson refused to attend any of his later hearings. The panel at that hearing noted that Manson had a history of controlling behavior and mental health issues, including schizophrenia and paranoid delusional disorder, and was too great a danger to be released. The panel also noted that Manson had received 108 rules violation reports, had no indication of remorse, no insight into the causative factors of the crimes, lacked understanding of the magnitude of the crimes, had an exceptional callous disregard for human suffering, and had no parole plans. At the April 11, 2012 parole hearing, it was determined that Manson would not be reconsidered for parole for another 15 years. In other words, not before the year 2027, at which time he would have been 92 years old. On January 1st of 2017, Manson was being held at Cochrane Prison when he was rushed to Mercy Hospital in downtown Bakersfield because he had gastrointestinal bleeding. A source told the Los Angeles Times that Manson was very ill, and TMZ reported that his doctors considered him too weak for surgery that normally would be performed in cases such as his. He was returned to prison on January 6, and the nature of his treatment was not disclosed. On November 15th of 2017, an unauthorized source said that Manson had returned to a hospital in Bakersfield, but the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation did not confirm this in conformity with state and federal medical privacy laws. Manson died from cardiac arrest resulting from respiratory failure brought on by colon cancer at the hospital on November 19th of 2017. Three people stated their intention to claim Manson's estate and body. Manson's grandson, Jason Freeman, stated his intent to take position of Manson's remains and personal effects. Manson's pen pal, Michael Channels, claimed to have a Manson will dated February 14, 2002, which left Manson's entire estate and Manson's body to Channels. Manson's friend, Ben Gurecki, claimed to have a Manson will dated January 2017, which gives the estate and Manson's body to Matthew Roberts, another alleged son of Manson's. In 2012, CNN ran a DNA match to see if Freeman and Roberts were related to each other and found that they were not. According to CNN, two prior attempts to DNA match Roberts with genetic material from Manson failed, but the results were reportedly contaminated. On March 12th of 2018, the Kern County Superior Court in California decided in favor of Freeman in regards to Manson's body. Freeman had Manson cremated on March 20th of 2018. As of right now, Channels and Freeman still had petitions to California courts attempting to establish the hire of Manson's estate. At that time, Channels was attempting to force Freeman to submit DNA to the court for testing. 
Manson is breaking news. Charles Manson, the infamous cult leader who led a string of murders in the 1960s, is dead. Still adoring followers carried out crimes in his name long after his conviction, including the attempted assassination of President Gerald Ford. Five Manson family members remain behind bars. He leaves behind a legacy of depraved murder. Make us some money, make the world look fun. Yes, they glance on through a burning asshole down through the castles of the vampire dream. And in old Frankenstein, I am mean man in a can. We're down on that lonesome road where nobody goes. It's a terrible. Thing. It's just the peace in your heart, you know. It's just the peace in your heart that you're playing like a part of another world, someplace, somewhere. As if there was another dream way beyond what you see. Manson has stood out as being of particular psychological fascination and revulsion because of his alleged ability to exercise such a mental hold over others, getting them to perform brutal slayings under his influence. This power over others appeared to endure up until nearly the end of his life. He was granted in 2014 a marriage license to wed Afton Burton, who was 26 years old at the time. The marriage license expired in February of 2015, yet their relationship had allegedly lasted almost 10 years, with Afton first writing to him as a teenager. Because he was serving a life sentence, the two were not allowed conjugal visits. There is even a term with forensic psychology referred to as hybristophilia, variously defined as being attracted to or even being erotically stimulated by dangerous individuals. Some specialists believe this is a kind of disturbed attraction in much the same way people can become fixated on other fetishes, often termed perversions or paraphilias. This phenomenon of women becoming drawn to and even eventually marrying infamous killers is well known. Others will argue that becoming apparently indispensable to someone who is completely dependent on them, just perhaps like a baby, means that this very primitive drive in some women is how they become healed from a childhood trauma. Perhaps these women are often groomed, even from prison, or seduced by the imprisoned men's apparent vulnerability, and the prisoners can be very manipulative, explaining that the case against them is flawed, which brings out the maternal and rescue instinct in some women. Some say that the innocence of the hippie counterculture revolution of ultimate freedom that started in the 1960s ended, partly because it was killed by Charles Manson. I am not sure about that, but I do know that Sharon Tate and her friends that night, along with the La Biancas, were all killed because of Charles Manson. Aptitude tests determined that although Charlie was illiterate, he had an above average IQ of 109. Manson was a sociopath, or he had antisocial personality disorder. Antisocial personality disorder is a long-term pattern of exploiting and violating others with no real remorse. Manson secured his cult, which at its peak consisted of about 100 casual followers and about 30 core members, through misogyny. He manipulated, isolated, and wore down the resistance of the many women he drew to him, and he used them ruthlessly. He routinely relied on the devotion of his female followers to gain power, either through their direct labor on his behalf or through their willingness to trade sexual favors to whomever Manson wanted for whatever Manson wanted for himself. Beneath all of Manson's theatrics, his bizarre ramblings, his controlling behavior, and violent outbursts, his real cultural impact lay in his ability to make his run-of-the-mill petty crimes and all-too-common control and dominance of women seem like something larger than life. 
but Charlie's evil wasn't outsized. He was an average narcissist who practiced social engineering and learned to use the bodies of willing women around him as a bargaining tool. His rise to prominence and the violence he engendered says more about the complicated moment in which he moved and the gender and social roles he exploited than his own special talents as a master manipulator. Manson's power was built not on his own abilities, but on the bodies, sacrifices, and ravaged souls of the women he took into the family, long before they began to kill for his sake. It's hard to overstate the lasting cultural impact of Charlie's aim into the heart of Hollywood. Before Manson, cults and religious organizations like Hare Krishna, Scientology, and other countercultural sects that arose in the mid-20th century were generally considered kooky but on the fringe. But the senseless gore of the Manson family murders, alternately known as the Tate LaBianca murders, in reference to the two families Manson followers targeted during their two-day killing spree, appended that impression. Manson's famously wide-eyed stare, his deep-seated racism, and the group of young women who rushed to his defense while brushing off the acts of extreme violence they or their friends have committed in his name all made Manson synonymous with cult leaders. He brought cults and their destructive tendencies into modern public consciousness. Charlie will be remembered as the wild-eyed man behind the murderous Manson family cult, one of the most notorious cults in history.